So uh, my name is Mark Langley, the founder of the National Public Safety Drone Donation Program. And we've partnered with Dynamic International. Michael Ashmore is the president of that company. And what we're looking forward to sharing with everyone here today is the ins and outs and some of the things that many of us don't know about the uh, complexities of grant writing, how grant writing is or grant opportunities are available. Michael's going to go into some uh, detail that may be sharing information that you've never been aware of. And we're really looking forward to do this on a monthly basis. So if you can't stay for the whole thing today, just, you know, go when you need. We'll, we're going to have a recording available and uh, we're going to do this monthly. So if you want to be on our email list, just make sure uh, you don't respond back uh, as, as having to be removed and we'll make sure you get notification of these moving forward. Without any further ado, uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Asmore, it's all yours. Thanks, Mark, I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Michael Asmore and I own a company called Dynamic International. Um, I've been in the industry for about 14 plus years as a consulting firm and I have about 20 years of experience of working on the business side of public safety. Uh, in terms of sales, marketing, advertising. Uh, just some real quick housekeeping. Uh, we're gonna be recording the session. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. If you're not sure how to do that, you have a reaction icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you'll have an option that says raise hand. Um, I will take questions at the end of the uh, training. The training's gonna probably go about 45, 50 minutes and I'll leave 10 minutes or so for question and answer. Um, if you can do me a favor, if you are in the business side of this industry, please uh, put that in the comment box as a yes. Uh, if you're not, no worries, because I usually create this training for both businesses and end users. But if we have just end users on the call, I'd like to just talk to the end users and not bring in the business stuff. And then that way, uh, everything's more specifically uh, geared to you folks. So it looks like we have all end users, which is great. If you haven't, if you're an end user, give me a thumbs up. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. So let me then, I'm going to share my screen and pull up my PowerPoint. And we'll get started. There you go. All right. PowerPoint. Share. Tom thinks he's on the business end, he just said. Okay, perfect. Then I'll make sure I talk on both sides. Uh, Tangi, Tangi, I believe. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So what I call this is the grant funding assistance strategy. That's really what it is. And, and to kind of give you some background, um, I created it through my business in 2007 for state and local end users that need solutions, but due to funding issues, they could not afford to buy them. The problem I saw in the marketplace was that state and local end users had needs and wanted solutions. It didn't matter if it was equipment, software, or training. Uh, the companies would educate the end users on the solution. End users would commit to buying the solution if it was a fit, but due to money uh, to make the purchase, it was difficult, most of the time because of budget issues. And I really tested this when I was on the sales side of the industry. And to give you some background, uh, I'm an anomaly. Uh, I've been in the industry 20 years, but I was never a cop or a fireman or in the military. And I was hired as a sales rep to sell SWAT gear back in 2001. Um, I literally started in this industry two weeks after 9-11. September uh, 25th was my first day uh, in the industry. And so um, you know, I, I basically, I would shadow the owner of the company. We'd go out on sales calls and I took notes and whatever he did, I wrote down what to do. And if there was quotes to be created, or if we needed to send a product out for testing and evaluation, I do that. Uh, and, and when I got back to the office, I would take action. And then about six months into the, uh, into being in the industry, right around April of 2002, um, I started going on sales calls on my own. And I go out and see the end users. And again, I was selling the special ops on the law enforcement side. And within about 15, 20 seconds, they knew I would never walk in their shoes. And I had some of them even ask me, they'd say, you know, Michael, you seem like a great guy, but what are you doing here selling this gear? You've never used it before. And I, you know, I explained in my background, I was a headhunter before I got into this industry. I was used to hitting the phones and making phone calls and, and, and helping find people jobs. 
And I sold product on features, advantages, and benefits. So I would explain the features, the advantages, and the benefits. Uh, the customers liked that. They liked the fact that I wasn't telling them what to do based on my experience. Well, number one, because I didn't have any experience. Uh, but I was not a pushy person. It was more about here's what the products do. Try it out for yourself. They would share with me what they would learn. And then I would share that amongst my territory. And I was covering a territory of about 26 states. So what I would hear in Illinois, where I'm based out of, I'd share with people in Florida. And what I would hear from people in Florida, I would share with people in Virginia. And, that's, and I did a lot of what I would call cross-pollination of information. Um, so after demoing, after quoting, I'd follow up. And one thing I was good at was asking sales questions. So I'd ask, you know, do you like the equipment? Is it going to solve your problem? Great. Is the price good? Okay, excellent. When are you, do you think you're going to buy? And when I'd ask that question, the answer I always got was, I don't know. And I was confused about that because by April of 2002, Homeland Security was formed. And all I heard of about was there was $4.2 billion of federal money getting uh, pumped into the state and local government market to help public safety agencies optimize their capabilities with equipment and training. And it didn't make sense that they didn't know when they were going to buy because all I heard about was all this money. So I asked the question about, you know, what about all this Homeland Security money? The answer I always got was, we don't know how to get that money. And then one day I asked a question, which is why I'm still here today. The question I asked was, if I help you find that money, would you buy from me? And the answer was always yes. So from there really is how the grant assistance strategy began. And it started off with federal grants. And on the business side, I was able to take a territory that was selling about a million dollars a year of equipment, and I grew it to $9 million a year. So I was able to help out hundreds and hundreds of agencies over my time as a salesperson find federal money to purchase equipment. And over the years, this strategy has morphed. It got into state grants and now private funding. So what I'm going to be teaching you today is really all about solving this problem. End users currently, I find, do not know how and where to find money. And they must continue to do their duties and responsibilities without the best equipment that saves them time, saves them money, reduces liability, and saves lives. And one of the things that I really appreciate about the drone program is the fact that it is all about giving you eyes where you normally can't see, saving you time based on what you're able to see from a different vantage point, reducing liability because you're not putting yourself in harm's way as much, and then ultimately saving lives. And I, I'm excited as I've watched the drone program develop over the last couple of years. I, I would used to use the analogy of a race that was going to start, and it was before the race. And when you watch a race, you see all the, uh, all the people running the race, they're stretching, they're loosening up, they're walking around the track, and then they start getting into the starting blocks and then they fire the gun and then they run. I feel like we're at the point now where that gun's been fired and people are able to start running. So I'm excited to really show how grants can really help optimize and grow your drone program. So the grant funding assistance strategy is simply this. It is identifying available federal, private, and state grants that are available in every state, understanding what the categories are. And I'll go in a little bit deeper in the categories, but just to give you kind of an overview premise, the categories are typically going to be, um, you know, for drones, fire, police, or law enforcement, if you will, emergency management, community development, enhancement, or improvement. Disaster preparedness, response, or recovery. Then it's from there is determining the deadlines. When are these grants going to expire? A good example is that your DHS grants currently, they're due to expire uh, May 14th. So, and that's the application part when I say expire. Um, so your UAC grant, your state homeland security grant, your, your uh, operation stone garden, your port security grant, just to name a couple examples. Uh, applications are going to be due by the 14th of May. So we're roughly about one week out. 
uh, then descriptions. You know, what are these grants? Are these grants specifically pertinent to a type of agency, a region? Um, why are they created? So descriptions are, are, are the next thing we, we share. Uh, funding amounts, amounts available. You know, how big of a pool of money is it? Your Homeland Security grants are about $2 billion. Uh, then there's the American Rescue Plan, which you might have heard about recently that President Biden signed off on. That grant is worth $350 billion, by far the most massive of all the grants. And what I tell businesses and I tell end users is this, if you can figure out a way to show how your project is going to help, not just with COVID, but with any type of a pandemic, because let's face it, I honestly doubt COVID's the last pandemic we're going to have to deal with. Hopefully not for a long time, but I'm sure that there's something going to be coming after it. If you could show how your program is going to help solve that problem or mitigate that problem or make it easier, you're going to be able to tap into that $350 billion. And we'll dig into that later. And our grant strategies also include website links. So when I build out a grant strategy, which I'm going to teach you all how to do today, I'm going to teach you everything I show you here. I like to provide businesses and end users the, the grants that are available in the state that's important to them, the category those grants fall under, the deadline when those grants expire, the descriptions of how or what that grant's about, the amounts available for the fund, and then the links. So when I do things for businesses, um, I do this. I build a strategy around your solution. End users really need to focus on grants that are available. Businesses need to focus on grants that are available for their solution. So when I work with a company, I teach them how to teach end users to pursue grant funding, locate grants that are available, locate the person that can help them uh, in their state with that grant, specifically called the point of contact, how to build a justification paper, and then how to secure and protect that funding. And I'm going to teach you all that as end users today as well. So you're going to learn how to create a list of grants that fit your needs, and you're going to learn how to do those five key points. I like to start, though, at the beginning, because here's the reality. I don't know how experienced the people are on these calls. Sometimes I'm talking to experts at grants. Sometimes I'm talking to people that have never written a grant before in their life. So I always like to set the terms. And the first thing is that let's define what a grant is. A grant is a sum of money given by an organization, especially a government for a particular purpose. Now with that grant, there are two players. There is the grantor and the grantee. The grantor is the individual in charge of distributing a sum of money for a particular purpose. The grantee is the person or organization that receives that sum of money for a particular purpose. And there's three types of grants that matter to public safety. Federal grants, private grants, and state grants. A private grant typically comes from three sources, a corporation or a business, a foundation or a nonprofit. And we're gonna dive into those deeper in the next couple slides. It's a two-step process to filling out a grant. You have an application, which will ask you specific city, county, and state information. And then there's writing the justification paper or the grant narrative. And sometimes these grant applications will have the narrative mixed into it. So what do I mean? You'll be filling out and answering the typical grant application questions you get. And then there'll be a question that's going to say 500 or words or less. Tell us about the project. And that's when you're going to tell them about the project. Fill out a couple more questions and they'll say, tell us about the problem in 500 words or less. Or maybe it's a thousand characters or less. It could vary. That's when you're going to tell them about the problem that you're experiencing in your community. So you'll either see the short answer mixed in with the application or the application and the justification paper. The beauty now is most of these are online. Back in the early 2000s, you would have to print off the application, fill it out manually, fax it, or scan it in and send it off. Now you can actually enter it on their websites. So let's take a minute and talk about challenges that I see in the market today. 
So typical local funding challenges in the roles grant play. The first thing I notice is government budgets are getting smaller and smaller. Usually it's the economy. It's either the real estate market or it's taxes. Uh, COVID is causing a lot of businesses to close. Uh, mostly um, I'm seeing right off the bat is retail or restaurants. And when those close, there's less tax revenue coming into their community. The other thing I see is real estate market. The interesting thing right now is the real estate market, at least where I live, is going up. I don't know if it's going to continue that way because of all the government spending we've been doing on the federal level and printing money. But again, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I don't have a crystal ball. But all I tell, tell businesses and I tell end users is this, be prepared to see change because change is always happening. Nothing ever stays the same, either good or bad. It's always moving. Another thing I see when it comes to challenges, I see a lot of elected officials want to say on what goods and services public safety agencies are purchasing. And, and it's not right or wrong. It's just over the last decade or so, I'm having a lot of end users tell me they're having to go in front of city council or county boards, present their projects to get approvals to purchase or even get approvals to move forward on applying for a grant. I also am seeing more and more life-saving products and services for departments. They're not as considered a high priority due to other needs. One of the things I, I educate the business side about is make sure your product or solution is used quite a bit. And the more reasons it's used, the better chance an end user is gonna be able to buy it. So, um, you know, if it's something that's not used every day, it's gonna be lower on the list. And, and that's just the way it is. And coming from the special operations side, you know, there might be times where they're using their products five, six, 10 times in a year. Whereas maybe patrol or maybe uh, another part of operations is using it daily. So that's something you always have to be in consideration. I also see the higher cost of the product or service, the harder it is to get it approved for purchases. Um, you know, I, I've worked on the past on everything from mobile command vehicles to armored personal carriers to ground robots. I've done some work with drones as well, uh, chem bio equipment from chemical suits and PPE to decon. And the reality is this, the bigger the cost of the package, the more difficult it is to get the approvals for purchase. And, and the end result I see is these products or services, they keep getting bumped from the budget every year. And over the last year, if it hasn't been made clear, the last year has done it. Local agencies now more than ever have to be prepared more than ever before. If you would have said to us in January of last year that we were gonna have a pandemic that was gonna shut down our society for roughly over a year in, in some cases, we all would have said there's no way it was gonna happen. Um, you know, We've seen a lot of natural issues like wildland fires, We've always had the hurricane season. We've had earthquakes. We've had flooding. Um, we've had civil unrest, and we've had a lot of you know. A lot, lately, it's been a lot of shootings. And the reality is, you have to be prepared more than ever if you're in public safety. Doesn't matter if you're on the police side, the fire, EMS, emergency management, 911 center, public health. You all have to be prepared. And to to attain this high level of preparedness. Budgets need enhancements through grants. That's just the way it is. So, you know, when people ask me on the business side, why does it take so long for an opportunity to close? I don't think they always appreciate what you have to go through as an end user. And some of this might sound familiar, but the typical per cycle I see for purchasing starts off with a lead. May it be a lead off of the website the company has or a marketing campaign or a cold call or maybe a trade show, which are gonna start up again in a few months. Uh, maybe it's an inbound call. Then the business has a conversation with the end user to learn more about what's going on. They send them product information. Maybe it's a face-to-face -face demo. A lot of times now we're having more virtual demos with Zoom and Google Meets. Uh, a formal quote is created. Then the, the, then the project is submitted to elected officials more often than not for approval to move forward. Then maybe it's work on the grant and the justification paper, submit the grant, and then get the funding awarded. That's a typical process. 
And the part that's the most curious is the elected officials approval to move forward. You see, I have that in bold. The reason I have that in bold is I'm seeing nowadays elected officials getting involved sometimes up to six to seven times they're voting on a project. And every time they vote, it's not a daily vote. It's typically a monthly vote, which means that project just from the voting alone is going to take an extra six to seven months. So, and, and the problem is, as an end user, when you talk to a business about getting their solution, the reality is you want to solve that problem now, not six months or seven months from now. And so what I'm going to teach you today is a few strategies to help speed up that process. So let's start first and foremost. The number one thing to getting a project completed and funded and getting what you need, may it be equipment, software, or training, is knowing how to sell the project. So what I teach end users is one, we must get clear on who's gonna approve this project. You know, sometimes it's the leadership at the agency. Sometimes it's the agency leaders and a city council or a county board. If it's a regional response, it could be a regional board, or if it's a state project, it will be state administrators. And by getting clear who's gonna approve this project, I like to use the analogy of chess. Now, if I'm playing chess against anybody and I have one piece on the board, they have one piece on the board, depending on the piece, I could have a 50-50 chance of winning that chess match. But if I have two pieces on the board to their one, my odds go up. If I have three, they go up even more. If I have four, they go up even more. So when you're clear on who's going to approve a project, what that really means is it's time to build a team. It's time to build a coalition or a group that's going to want this project to get funded. And with the drone project, there's so many benefits to having one. So, I mean, you're able to, again, get eyes on a vantage point. You know, if it's a traffic accident, you get a traffic scene, you get a view from up top. Uh, it can map out the situation as well. Uh, if it's a hazmat situation, you could fly the drone above a hazmat situation to get a clear idea of what's going on. You could attach sensors to it to get readings. Uh, if it's a fire, you can have a thermal camera above it so you can kind of see where the hot spots are. Uh, if it's a SWAT call out and there's a barricaded subject in a building, you can get an idea of a perimeter by flying the drone around. There's so many things you can do with a drone program. And that's the beauty of it. The truth, though, is to get that sold, you've got to get leadership on board at your agency. So it might be one division of the, of the agency that wants a drone. You got to get more than that. You got to get as many parts of that agency on board. Then from there, you got to sell that city council or that county board or that regional board or those state administrators because they're the ones that are going to vote yes or no. And, and the reality is they want to vote for two reasons. And this is not right or wrong, and this is not Democrat or Republican or the left or the right or conservative or liberal. This is just generally what I've seen over the last few years. And the number one thing I see is approvals are needed because taxpayers pay public safety personnel salaries. So because of that, city councils and county boards want to have a good idea of what they're looking to do. They don't want them to go on a wild goose chase. They don't want them chasing after funding for a project that's not fundable. Um, they want to make sure they have a good idea of what's happening. I also see some uh, public uh, safety agencies at the mercy of elected officials that look at a project and say to themselves, will this hurt me uh, if I want to keep my seat at the next election? And sometimes they will vote on projects that even though you feel as a public safety agency is going to add value to your agency and the community, they might not see it that way. Again, another reason why to sit down with them and explain to them what you're looking to accomplish so they can understand and appreciate your world. So how to, how, so let's help the end user sell your solutions to get approval. So how do you get approvals? The first thing is the end user must show if they're looking to get approvals on a project, how it can be realistically funded through a grant. May it be a federal grant, may it be a state grant, may it be a private grant. If they can connect the dots between those grants and what they want as terms of a project, that's gonna make it easier. The second thing they're gonna to wanna to do is show how the project's gonna save time, save money, reduce liability, or save lives. 
And I'm going to harp on that multiple times. And if you're on the business side and sitting in on this call, you have to make sure your sales and marketing material shows how your solution is going to save that end user time, save money, reduce liability, save lives. If you're an end user and you're applying for a grant, that grantor, the one that's going to write that check for your project, needs to understand crystal clear how this project's going to save time, save money, reduce liability, and save lives. That is a key, and I will probably bring that up multiple times throughout this presentation. So let's talk about drones and, pro and the product offering and what's called the AEL. If you've not heard of the AEL, AEL stands for the Authorized Equipment List. And what it is, it's a list of approved equipment types that are allowed under FEMA's Preparedness Grant Program. The intended audience of this tool is your emergency managers, first responders, may they be fire, police, EMS, and other Homeland Security professionals. And the way it works is it is a list and it contains 21 equipment categories that are divided into categories and then subcategories and then equipment items. I use the analogy of a, of a file cabinet because we all have file cabinets either in our office or at our agency or wherever we might work. Think of it this way. The 21 equipment categories are 21 file cabinets. When you open up your file cabinet, what do you normally see? You usually see hanging files, right? Sometimes they're green, sometimes they're blue. And the hanging files are those secondary categories. Now, what's typically in your hanging file? Manila folders, right? So your manila envelope folders, you take those out. Those would be your subcategories. And what's typically found inside those manila folders or manila envelopes? Paper. Each piece of paper is the product or the individual equipment itself. And that's how I want you to think of the AEL, 21 file cabinets with hanging files, manila envelopes, paper. So note, there are never commercial, I'm sorry, commercially available products listed. These equipment items are just equipment types. You're not going to see a brand there. So you're not going to see like an example on drone. Most people are familiar with DGI as an example. You're not going to see DGI mentioned anywhere on the AEL. You're going to see drone or you're going to see, uh, you know, you a you know unmanned aircraft system. You might see robots. You'll see remotely piloted vehicles. Now below are the two AEL authorized equipment list line item numbers that matter to you folks about drones, because you're either looking for a drone itself, which is the zero three O E dash zero seven dash S U A S, which stands for small unmanned aircraft system or you're interested in the 030E-07-UPGD, which is the ro robots or remotely piloted vehicle upgrades. Because you're either looking for a drone or accessories for that drone. And upgrades could be hard items that go onto the drone and it could be software that goes into the brain of the drone. So now let's talk about grants to think about. What grants should you be focusing on if you're looking to get your drone program funded or if you're looking to add to it? And one of the things I forgot to mention earlier, if you see a, a slide that you like, take a picture of it. And if you want me to go back to some slides, I can go back to them as well after we're done. All you gotta do is raise your hand using the uh, raise your hand button at the bottom of your page and I will go back and you're more than welcome to take images. I don't give out the, the presentation as a whole, but if you want to take pictures of slides, please do so. And again, we're, we're recording this now and we'll have it available for you folks in the future. So federal grants, there's the American Rescue Plan, which I talked about earlier. Again, $350 billion, by far the largest funded program for public safety. Then if you're on the fire side, there's the AFG or Assistance to Firefighters Grant. They also have a COVID-19 supplemental grant as well. Then there's the Community Development Block Grant Programs. There's also the Community Facility Direct Loan and Grant Programs. Both of those community grants through the federal government, I have seen equipment purchased 
through both of those. So those are definitely viable sources. You also have the CARES Act, which came out uh, prior to the Biden administration. Then the Homeland Security Grant Program, which is made up of the State Homeland Security Program, UASI, or the Urban Area Security Initiative, or the top 25 largest regions or cities in the country. Operation Stone Garden. So if you're on a border state, may it be bordering Mexico, bordering Canada, or bordering a body of water, you can apply for Stone Garden money. Port Security Grant Program. If you have a port or harbor in your community, you can apply for, for that grant. Or if you're a volunteer agency, there's a Volunteer Fire Assistance Grant Program. Those would be federal grants that you should think about if you're looking to add on to your drone program or build it from scratch. Now let's talk about private grants and I'm gonna break them into a couple categories. For public safety grants, and these are grants from organizations that will fund public safety projects. The first one is probably the most popular right now, Firehouse Subs. Firehouse Subs is a sandwich shop, very much similar to a Subway or a Potbellies or a Jersey Mike or a Cousins Sub, depending on the region of the country you're in. They have a foundation that will fund projects for public safety agencies. Uh, in 2020, they funded over a hundred projects um, that went up to a hundred thousand dollars I saw. This year, they changed it a bit. They've already done over a hundred projects this year, but they've lowered the dollar amount to right around a max of $25,000. But that means this year, they're gonna spend about $10 million on public safety agency projects. So it's a good one to think about. Gary Sinise Foundation. If you're familiar with Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump, or if you're familiar with CSI New York, Gary Sinise was, was a, a character or played a character in both those uh, show and movies. He has a foundation that raises money for soldiers coming back from war, raises money for soldiers and, and uh, public safety officers suffering from PTSD. He also funds a lot of uh, PPE replacement for COVID and he funds projects for public safety. I just worked on a project with, uh, with an organization. Uh, they got awarded Gary Sinise money for turnout gear. They will fund drone programs. Georgia Pacific Bucket Brigade Grant Program. That one's great for fire. Mission Barbecue, this is kind of a new one on the scene. If, if you've ever been to a Mission Barbecue restaurant, they have a, a, a foundation that raises money for public safety projects too. Then you have community grants. May they be community development, enhancement, or improvement. Businesses like Chevron, City Foundation, which is Citibank, Enterprise Holding Foundation, which is Enterprise Rental Car. Those are some examples of businesses that will fund projects to develop, enhance, or improve a community. And this is where I'm usually asked, but I'm looking to fund a drone program. Well, the reality is this, if you can optimize your public safety's capabilities, you're developing, enhancing, or improving your community. It's a fit. So the, think of them as funnels. If there's a grant for fire, it's a narrow funnel. If there's a grant for police, it's a narrow funnel. If it's a community grant, that funnel's bigger because more things could get funneled into it. But what the key is, as long as your project is well laid out, they will fund public safety projects through community grants. So they're absolutely something you should consider. Disaster grants, maybe they be disaster preparedness, response or recovery or relief grants. Couple examples, all state insurance, they have their foundation that will fund uh, public safety projects. Amazon, they have a, a contribution program. Cooper Tire, Dow Chemical Company, these are examples of businesses that will fund projects to help prepare for a disaster, recover, response, or provide relief. Drone programs can easily do that as well. So you wanna keep those types of grants in mind. In general, places to look for private grants, banks. Banks will fund projects to enhance public safety capabilities. Energy companies, your gas companies, your power companies, electric companies, they will fund projects to optimize public safety's capabilities because the better that public safety agency can do their job, the better their soft targets protected. Insurance companies, 
manufacturing companies, public safety foundations. There's more and more public safety agencies that have a foundation connected to them. So an example, like San Diego Police Department has a foundation. It's the San Diego Police Foundation. They will fund projects that the budget doesn't cover for the San Diego Police Department, as an example. There are hundreds of these nationwide. And if your agency doesn't have one, I would look to figure out what has to happen to get one set up. Because then you can raise money through your community, goes into that foundation, and then the foundation can either supply a check or buy the equipment on your behalf. Railroads, if you have railroads that go through your community, those railroad companies that drive on those railroads, they will fund projects to enhance public safety. Again, they're a soft target. They wanna make sure that you could do your job better because you protect them better. Then there's regional community foundations. And these are a hidden gem. There's about close to 800 of them nationwide. A regional foundation or community foundation Think of it like a private equity firm. So what do I mean? I'll give you an example. We use San Diego as an example to start off with. There is a foundation called the San Diego Community Foundation, and they will fund projects to better any nonprofit in San Diego city or county. So if you're a town in San Diego County, you can apply to get money from them for a project. And what they do is when they raise funds in their community, they reinvest those funds and grow them to larger funds. Com regional community foundations could be one county or it could be a cluster of counties. What determines it is this population size of that region. The beauty is though, I've seen them from seven to eight to nine to 10 figures big. So from millions of dollars in their funds, to I've seen four or five of them that have over a billion dollars in their fund and they will fund projects, but the key is making the project sound and viable. Then there's state grants. The most common ones people are familiar with is the justice assistance grant or the burn grant or the JAG grant. And there either is the, the burn grant that goes to the states and then the states decide what are the most important issues of projects they'll fund and then there's a just assistance grant on the law enforcement side that goes to cities and counties. And that's typically a formula grant based on population and crime rates. On the fire side, there's a rural community fire protection grant program. That goes to communities that have a population size of 10,000 or less people. Now, the interesting thing is these grants start at the federal level but they get funneled down to the state and then the state has representatives that distribute the money. So that's why I call them state grants as opposed to federal grants. But those are the most common ones that people use and those are great for drone programs. So now we've talked about the grants. The next thing I always teach end users to do is to build rapport with the grantor. A lot of times, end users, agencies are conditioned to just fill out an application and send it in. You could do that. What I'm gonna teach you is gonna increase your odds of success. And that's building rapport. Get to know the point of contact. Couple facts, every grant, doesn't matter if it's state, private or federal, has a point of contact or a POC. Their job is to answer questions about the grant process, review and approve the grant application and grant justification paper, and then cut a check for the grant that's approved. So why is it important to understand who the point of contact is and to build rapport with them? Three reasons. One, it's their responsibility to spend this allocated money on viable sound projects. One of the misconceptions people have on the end user side is there's no money. The reality is there's billions of dollars out there. I mean, I think I've probably shared with you probably close to a half a trillion dollars of money, may it be federal, private or state that's out there right now at this minute. The challenge though is these grantors will only spend the money on projects that are sound and viable. They have to spend the money. Once it ends up in their lap, they have to get rid of it. It's their job to give the money out, but they're not just gonna give it out to anybody. 
They're only going to give it out is if the project makes sense. They have to understand your needs. And remember, the point of contact understands the grant and they understand the mission of the grantor. That's why they're the point of contact. Their job is to answer questions for you. If you're an end user, if you have a question, you should be calling these grantors. If you don't have a question, you should be calling these grantors. Get to know them. Build rapport with them. It's essential. Their job is to make sure you are successful in getting funding. The best way they're going to be, make sure you're successful is they get to know you. And one of my favorite things about rapport and my favorite sayings is this. When people are feeling they're alike, they will like each other. The better they know you and the better they know the project, the better chance you're going to get it funded. If you know, I live in a town called St. Charles, Illinois. If I'm part of St. Charles Fire and I apply for a grant, I can be successful as long as my project is sound and viable. But if I'm Lieutenant Asimore calling up on behalf of the St. Charles Fire Department and I'm talking to that grantor and that point of contact and they get to know me and I get to know them and I get to ask them questions to increase my chances of success, it's a different ball game. Your odds go up exponentially. Then from there, there's the components of successful grant justification paper. So we're, we've, we've identified the grants to target. We have talked to the, the grantor's point of contact and built rapport. So now we have to do the heavy lifting and build a justification paper. But what is a justification paper? It's an affirmative case that addresses the current problem showing how your project's going to solve the problem. It does the following identifies a problem. We have problem X in our community. Then you quantify it. Problem X is this big. It's this big because we have a population size of blank. During the work week, our population size grows from blank to blank. Uh, we have X amount of call outs per year and they've gone up by X percent over the last five years. We have an airport in our community. We have manufacturing in our community. We have X amount of schools in our community with Y amount of students. We have a water treatment system in our community. We have a sewage system in our community. Whatever it is, you wanna show how big the problem is by magnifying it, by going into details of everything that plays a role in this problem. We have X amount of railroads. We have Y amount of highways, we have highways, we have interstates, we have state routes, we have county roads, we have, we, have, we have airports, we have a regional airport, we have a national airport. All of these are examples of soft targets. Then from there, you gotta show how the project's gonna save time, save money, reduce liability and save lives. So those are those four big points. And you wanna make sure you connect project with those four solutions. If you could do all four, outstanding. If you can only do one of four, that's good too. It's not a deal breaker. As long as that one is a massive explanation and it's connected and it's justifiable. Then from there, you have to show how you're gonna implement the project from 12 months, from purchase to delivery, to training, Leveraging the media, notifying the media, may it be print media, internet media, radio, news, television news, whoever. Tell the media about this whole journey. We had this problem. We applied for this grant. We got this amount of funding. We bought this equipment and now we're getting trained on it. Notify the community. Make sure your businesses in your community know. Make sure that the churches know. Make sure as many people know about this project because this project's to benefit them. The more good publicity, the better. And then the cost, it's gotta be specific. It can't be a ballpark number. It's gotta be specific based on the quote from the business you're looking to buy from. Lastly, your role in securing and protecting awarded grant funding. So why is securing and protecting grant funding important and necessary? Couple reasons. There are multiple parts of your agency that have projects that need to be funded. Something I think on the business side, they don't always understand and appreciate. But you know, 
you might work in operations. Well, there's special operations, there's training, there's IT, there's support services, there's administration. If you're on the law enforcement side, there's investigations. There are so many parts of an agency and they're all looking for projects to get funded. And the reality it is the end users in charge of those projects will do whatever they can to get the funding. And if there's funding sitting around, they're gonna to try to get their hands on it. And it's not like they're gonna steal it. They're just going to go to the leadership and, and explain their case. Captain, I know we got X amount of money sitting for around for this project and we're gonna spend on this project. And I totally get it. But my project needs to get funded too. And look what's happened recently because we aren't having it funded. There's, we can incur liability issues. Well, you don't want to lose your money from your project to somebody else at your agency because they're more persuasive. Because the reality is money's lost for the following reasons. It's either not spent quick enough, and sometimes it takes a year to two years to spend money. Federal grants can take up to two years before they're spent. State grants could take one year. Private grants, another reason why I like them is they're three to six months. They're much quicker. Um, but the reality is, if it's not spent quick enough, the longer it sits, the easier chance is to lose it. Again, someone else at the agency is more persuasive, so they're selling them on their project. And then lastly, maybe you don't have enough leverage with the leadership at this time to keep the money. I wanna reduce this from happening. And this is a strategy I've learned that works. I'd love to tell you it's a silver bullet, but I don't believe in silver bullets. But what I do believe is, for, is doing everything you can to make it as difficult as possible to lose your money. So here's what I teach. Strategies to secure and protect grant funding. One, build an agency team that supports the project. Maybe you work in one part of the agency. Leverage other parts of the agency to support your project. Great places to go. If you're in operations and you need additional support, talk to training. Talk to administration. Maybe talk to special ops. Get a team that supports the project so you're not just one person trying to move this mountain. There's a team of you trying to move it. Get your leadership behind the project. You know, you want to make, you know, it, you know, get the deputy chief, the battalion chief, get the commander, whoever it is, you want to make sure you get them on uh, to support the project as well. Then from there, you want to get elected officials behind the project. So you want to get in front of city council and county board, sidebar with them and talk to them, tell them about the project, bring them into the project as opposed to pitching the project to them. Make them a part of the team of this project. Get local businesses behind the project. Go talk to the local businesses. Explain to them what you're looking to do, why you're looking to do it. If you're, if you're saving time, saving money, reducing liability, or saving lives on a project, those local businesses are going to appreciate what you're doing. And on top of that, they might even cut you a check for that project. Businesses are always looking for write-offs to offset their gross uh, sales and their revenue coming in. Don't be surprised if local businesses want to support you. I was working on a project with the Oakland uh, Police Department, and it was for lighting. And it was about $30,000 in lighting, I think. They were able to get $25,000 by just notifying the local businesses in their community. The local businesses said, hey, I think it's a great idea. Can I help contribute? So they're either going to support you with their efforts or with their money, but get them on board. Community leaders, chamber of commerce, your local, your, your, your churches in your community, get your pastors on board, tell them about the project, tell them what you're looking to do, get them on board. They'll go to sit, they'll go to your elected officials too and say, listen, I was just talking to the fire department or the police department about this project. We really need this in our community. They'll put the pressure on the elected officials to support you as well. And then lastly, get your citizens, get your neighbors on, on board. We all live in either houses or townhomes or condos or apartments. We have neighbors, we have, we have subdivisions, we have communities we live in. Tell them about what you're doing, get them on board. They will also help to get the elected officials on board too. So how do you sway these hearts and minds? Tell them how the project saves time, saves money, reduces liability, 
saves lives. Sometimes justification information helps as well. Maybe there's NIM standard, the National Incident Management System that says this type of team has to have this type of equipment. Drones could be included in that. You'd have to do your research. Certifications, NIOSH, NFPA, NIJ, those are some examples of organizations that certify different products or solutions for public safety. The more justification you have, great. If you can't get any, it's not a deal breaker, but if you can, it just increases the strength of your project. So when it comes to grant assistance, as a grant consultant and a grant strategist, these are things that we can do and can't do. When I work with businesses or I work, you know, and that's typically what I usually do. I work with end users by supplying grant information. I work with businesses by building out these strategies. So someone like me, I can create a template and an outline that you can use to write your justification paper. I can review what you write and I can redline it like a legal document. So if you're an end user and you write a, a draft of a justification paper, I can look it over and see if there's ways I can optimize it, either through grammar or content. I cannot write it for you based on what I do. You can hire a grant writer to do that. And if you ever are looking for grant writers, at the end, you're gonna have all my contact info, reach out to me and I can set you up. In fact, we have one that's part of this nonprofit that we would recommend. Her name's Lauren and she's outstanding. Um, she could definitely help you there. Um, you know, I can review your application and I can give you advice on how to make it stronger. I personally can't write it. Person like Lauren can absolutely write it for you. Um, you know, and, and typically the reason why I can't write it is because I'm usually hired by companies and the way I've structured my business is I'm looked at as someone that would be colluding on the project. So I can't do it, but a person like Lauren can for you if you're an end user, if you're a business, I can definitely help build out a strategy for you. So if you have any questions, this is every way to get a hold of me. You can either call me at my office, 630-945-3605. My mobile number is 630-877-3130. My uh, email is maazamore at dynamic-international.net. If you have a question anytime, reach out to me. If you're more comfortable with reaching out to Mark first, reach out to Mark and he can bring me in. Whatever makes it easier for you to get your needs met when it comes to grants and applying for grants and understanding how to play the game. What I'd like to do now is take off my slide share and open it up for any questions you might have. And you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself. It's all good. Unless I did an outstanding job and I answered all the questions. Michael, I, I, have, I, have several, I got several questions, but I think what I'll do is give you a call later cool. on, on some of those, okay? Sounds like a plan, love it. Thank you. Tangie, I'm sorry, you had something to say, I, I apologize. No, I was saying it was a pretty thorough presentation, so. Cool, awesome. Michael, I wanna say, I want to say thank you. This is Mark and I just wanna mention Lauren uh, Michael's not only a partner supporter of NPS DDP, we're going to be doing this on a monthly basis, but Lauren is also joining us as a grant writer, and she will take on grant writing on a case-by-case -case basis from the, her regular fee to a reduced fee to maybe even no fee at all. And again, it goes to what Michael says, you need to make your argument, you need to explain why you need this service, this grant, this help. And this will go a long way to helping us help you. Um, so I, I really appreciate what uh, Lauren couldn't make it today. She had the prior prior engagement. She'll probably be joining us every month uh, as her schedule allows. And Lauren is outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding at what she does. So, so I, unless there's any other questions, Mike, I don't know. Go ahead. Uh, excellent. Yeah, no, if it, I mean, I'll, I'll, I can I can hang on for a couple more minutes. I, I have a two o'clock uh, coaching call after that. But I mean, I'm happy to hang if someone thinks of a question. If not, please let Mark uh, know how you like the presentation. If there's things you'd like to see 
me cover that maybe I didn't cover. I'm always happy to modify and optimize it. Um, my intention is this, and it's simple. I want to help everyone learn how to play this grant game. I want, because the better I can help teach you how to play this game, the better off you're going to be when you're on the, on the call and the more people you're going to save. And it's all about getting home people safely to their families and loved ones. Yeah. I sincerely love this industry and I love and appreciate what you all do. So it means a lot to me to make sure that you have everything you need to be successful. So whatever I can do, I'm happy to figure out a way to do it. Thank you, Michael. On behalf of the board of directors of National Public Safety Drone Donation Program, we can't thank all of you enough for the hard work that you do and uh, protecting your communities. We're here to help you. Uh, we want to help you be successful, and uh, we really appreciate you being a part of this presentation today. Thank you. What was the contact number again, Michael? Uh, my phone number? I, I, you broke up whoever asked the question. What was the uh, contact number for you again? Oh, 630-877-3130. That's my mobile. That's the best number to call me at. If I'm out of my office, my office line is forwarded to my mobile number. And if anybody wants a copy of this, a link for this presentation, please email me at admin at nps-ddp.org. And I'll be sure to make sure you get a copy of that. Can you repeat that one more time? NP, Nancy Paul Sam dash David David Paul dot org. Admin at nps-ddp.org. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to uh, have to end this because I got another call. It's going to be coming in. Post the email. Um, yeah, let me put it in the chat real quick. Okay, my bad. I'm going to put mine. And if you want to put yours in too, Mark, you could send yours right in as yep, well. I'm going to do it right now. Ed. And send that email address to download the, the um, podcast also, if you would uh it's it's now it's now in the chat good thank you yeah so go ahead and copy that and uh yeah or call me directly uh as well at 860-374-8510 uh that's my direct phone line again thank you everybody for your service and your participation thank you guys